volcanoes and icebergs. And uh, you already know which one you are. But there's some, uh, some words I'd like to share with you about this as we talk about, you know, we still continue the idea that God heals hearts. And that uh, Jesus is the great cardiologist. We're still in that theme of where God wants to improve and help our lives. And the subject of anger is definitely one I think needs to be uh, just uh, talked about. During World War II, there was a U.S. submarine by the name of Tang. Uh, that was under the cover of darkness near Turnabout Island, which is off of the China coast. Uh, it was there to fire upon a large Japanese convoy, and since the convoy was so large, every shot had to be spot on. And so it was. Every torpedo they launched met a target. The last torpedo they launched, though, broke for the turn. And it actually circled around, and they realized what had happened. They sound the alarm to die, but it was too late, and the submarine sunk and killed everyone for us. And sometimes in our hostility to others, we can destroy ourselves. So we're looking at a thing that has the potential to sink lives. We're looking at the subject of where a momentary lack of self-control can shackle a life forever. I've talked to several people who've been in prison, I've been in prisons and in jails, and I've talked to people that have, have been incarcerated, and it's quite amazing how many people are there because of an act that they committed, and it took under a minute to do it. They were spending years of their life incarcerated for an action that took place in under 60 seconds. And that's how powerful and dangerous, of course, anger uncontrolled can be. And Jesus wants to set us free. He wants to set us free not only uh, spiritually, but he wants to set us free emotionally. And he wants to mature us so that we have contentment and joy. And that contentment and joy would shine like a light in a dark culture like ours. And people would look at that and they would be drawn to that. And he wants us to be happy. He wants us to have uh, confidence and security. And then when others look at us that way, they're like... What is it about you? Everybody else is losing it but you. And that gives us an opportunity to glorify God, giving us credit for those things that are in our lives. Let me share a few stats that I ran across this week on the subject of anger. It seems like the average man loses his temper six times a week. And the average woman loses hers three times a week. <laughs> Women have a tendency to lose their anger and lose their temper about people. Men have a tendency to lose their temper over things. Have you ever seen a man with a vending machine that won't work? <laughs> when a woman is on the side of the road with a flat tire, she's like this. When a man is on the side of the road with a flat tire, he can get thrown around, he's slamming his stuff and throwing it out of the trunk. And yeah, that's how we get it. Here's a surprise in some of the research. Single people express their anger twice as often as married folks. And the home and the car is the place where people are most likely to have a temper flare. Some of you know this to be true. Some of you have actually made statements. I hope that Jesus doesn't come back while I'm driving. <laughs> What's that mean? It means love the people that love you. Amen? They have got to deal with the heat. They live with you, they ride with you, and they see that front and foremost. And so they're the ones who are most uh, frequently having to deal with the intensity. And so that just means love the people that love you. I appreciate that. Well, here's the fact. The fact is that all of us get angry. It's a normal response. God has made us with the capacity to get angry. Let me repeat that. It's God's idea that we get angry. We are made in God's image, amen? Guess what? God got mad 
75 times in the Old Testament. I mean, we're talking angry. We're not talking been out of shape. We're talking mad. We read that God was mad. So anger in and of itself isn't a sinful thing. Anger is something that Jesus had. Let me ask you, family, how long does it take to break a whip? He didn't go in there with it. But when he saw those money changers, and he saw those tables full of, of money and people who were uh, doing that in the God's temple, the house of prayer, how did he feel about it? He was how angry? Very angry because in a little while he's going to be kicking those tables over and he's going to use a whip. How long does it take to build one of those? Grade those things together. That's a premeditated plan, isn't it? What were the apostles thinking when they saw Jesus braid that whip? <laughs> I can just see Peter and John was like backed up against the wall. Imagine being a money changer in the temple that day and looking over at this young man, 30 years old, with fire in his eyes, kicks your table over and chases off your animals. What it must have been like to see the Savior enraged. And yet the Bible says he was made like us in every way, and yet was without sin. God gets mad. In fact, righteous indignation is proper. If you are righteous and something unjust and, and, and unrighteous and wicked is taking place, the reaction to that is anger. That's how we are built. We are built like that from God. Jesus wasn't just angry in the temple. He was angry uh, when he saw religious hucksters fleecing people or, or when he saw faith leaders uh, who were causing followers to stumble. He was mad when he saw hard-hearted people just walking past and not doing anything for the helpless and those who were suffering. And he was angry when he saw people twist the word of God to their advantage. In Psalm 4.4, 4, look at this verse. In your anger, do not sin. You see that? In your anger, do not sin. Therefore, there is a sinful anger, and there is a sinless anger. God was the very first person to ever suggest anger management. Goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Cain is very upset with his brother's sacrifice being accepted, and his not. And, and in chapter 4, God goes to Cain, and he asks him, why is your face downcast? What does a downcast face look like? <laughs> that is a face that's been cast down. He is stewing, and he is mad, and God approaches him, and he said, would you not have been accepted if you did the right thing? Do you know what God warned Cain with right after that question? He said, sin is crouching at your door. It seeks, it desires to have you, to control you, is the idea. He is warning Cain, Cain, Sin is like a lion crouching right outside your door. It's there to pounce on you. Now what's the greatest tragedy of all of it? God himself has appeared to Cain after Cain gets mad that his sacrifice was rejected and his brother was rejected. And he goes to him because he's, well, he's a father. God's a father. He cares. Amen? He goes to Cain in his anger and he said, hey, if you've done the right thing, boy, you wouldn't be mad. But I've got to warn you, sin is just about ready to control you. 
Did that stock came? Yes or no? Tragically. God is trying to help us manage our anger. So the issue of this sermon isn't really so much about anger prevention. It's about sin prevention. The issue we're going to look at is trying to understand our anger so that we can control it and that it doesn't uh, control us. So how can we as Christians ensure that we don't hurt ourselves or others when anger wells up? And so today we're really going to look at four models. Really, they're mismanagement models. The first one is not anybody you really know. I hope you don't think there's somebody from the church up there on the screen. <laughs> The first one is the monster. Oh, we all know the monsters. We've been around the monsters. The monsters explode. They get mad and nobody has to guess that they're mad. Everybody within earshot knows immediately that the monster is there. They're a walking time bomb. They have a hair trigger, a short fuse, and when they get mad, somebody is going to have to deal with it. There's yelling and stomping and ranting and raving and throwing and cursing. Sounds like coaches, doesn't it, right now? I'm thinking about Bobby Knight right now. Okay. Well, let me give you some, some, some examples from the Bible of monster rage anger types, the model. In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman goes to which prophet? <coughs> And he goes to Elijah to get healed from his leprosy. He's a commander in the army. And he's very important. He's very high ranking. He goes all the way to Israel so that the prophet will heal him of his leprosy. And then he is told by the prophet to do what? All right, some of you guys have read your Old Testament, right? Help me out. What's he told to do? Go wash in what river? The Jordan River. His reaction. Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord of God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any waters of Israel? Couldn't I have washed in them and been cleansed? And so he turned away and went off in a rage. Now that's monster monster. In Daniel chapter 3, it talks about where Nebuchadnezzar has built this gigantically huge golden image. And he proclaims, everyone must worship this golden image. Anybody who does not worship this golden image will be burned in a fiery furnace. And then Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego refuse to worship anyone but God. And so they don't. And their contemporaries and peers already don't like them. And so they go and tattle. Don't you love those folks? Don't you love the snitches, the tattles? They go and tattle the king. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they didn't worship the golden image. And so he calls them in. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, it says, didn't you worship them? And, and, and they said, no, we, we didn't and we won't. Don't you know I'm going to throw you in the fire furnace? If you do, God himself can deliver it. He wants to. That's the dialogue. And in verse 19, the Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury after these three Jewish young men refused to follow the king's edict. That's what got him mad. What's got him mad is not being obeyed. And so he orders the fire of the furnace to be kicked up how much? Seven times more than usual. That just represented his anger, didn't it? That fiery thing. In Proverbs 16, 18, I was reminded last week that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. So we need to be careful about being the monster model. The second one I want to share with you is the mute. They respond to anger the opposite of the monster. The mute is the silent type. They sit and hold it in and they fume. And they pretend they're not angry when they really are. You've been around a mute. 
You look at them and you say, wow, I bet you're really angry. No, I'm not. Well, I mean, after having that happen, you should be angry. Well, I'm not angry. Oh, now, come on. you got to be angry. Then they get mad at you because you're accusing them of being angry when they don't want to accept what they want. What they're doing is they're concealing their feelings or suppressing this emotion, and they let it simmer, I call it, Crockpot madness. Yes. It just stews all day. You can tell mutes. You can spot them out in a crowd. They've got rings under their eyes from lack of sleep. You see a lot of antacids on their counter. Someone once said that when you swallow your anger, your stomach keeps score. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. F. I. McMillan wrote a book years ago called None of These Diseases, and in it he listed 51 different types of major illnesses that are caused by bottled up anger. The mute. Here's the person who suffers silently. For example, Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 15. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 15, beginning at verse 17, says. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like water, that you can heal? Therefore, says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth, and they shall turn to you, and you shall not turn to them. And so we see Jeremiah, a biblical example of a mute, kind of an anger model, uh, of, of someone that just says, well, you know, it just burns me yeah. out. And uh, they're speaking more truth than they know. Unfortunately, long-term church members are susceptible to being mutes. They think that expressing anger is a sin somewhere along the line of their Christian development. Someone told them, if you lose your temper, you're sinning. And uh, so they never have allowed that expression of anger, and they keep it bottled up. And, uh, and so a lot of people in the church are susceptible to to uh, be used, to suffer. They're not coping with the anger. They're just suppressing it and burying it deep. The third character I want to tell you about is the martyr. This is the way uh, people react to having something unjust happen to them or something that causes them. They start to, to be punishing, self-punishing and passive. They're, they're really in their commiseration. Um, one of the chief characteristics of the martyr is depression. Many people will go to psychologists and I said, I don't know why I'm depressed. And it's not unusual for the psychologist to say, actually what you are is angry. And depression is a way of expressing that anger that you haven't resolved yet. A biblical example of this that comes to mind is found in Luke chapter 15. This is a story of the prodigal son. But this part of the story is not talking about the son that left. It's talking about the son that stayed home. And it says in Luke 15, in verse 28, the younger son has returned home. They're now celebrating a feast. And, and, and he, in verse 25, the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near the house, and he heard music and dancing. He called out to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, and your brothers come home, and your father's killed the fat calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was what? He was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. What was what his father doing? Come inside and what? Celebrate. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command. You never even gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Wow, does that sound like a pity party or what? He says, But when the son of yours came who devoured your property with prostitutes, you Kill the fatted calf for him. So I'm not going in there in that party. I got my own right here. Pity party. Feeling sorry for himself. Poor martyr. Now, if, he, if the older brother had been a monster, he'd have busted in on that thing and started throwing chairs or whatever and making a big ruckus. 
What do you do and celebrate this prodigal? If he was a mute, he would have been inside the house, in the corner, not eating. Just sitting over there, stewing. But now he's a martyr. He's outside. And he's feeling sorry for himself. And uh, the problem with martyrs is, is they have a tendency to make everybody else feel better. And again, Christians can be susceptible to this type of management, anger and mismanagement due to being self-righteous. Well, I didn't deserve this. Well, I've been a good Christian. Then why? And so, there's one more mismanagement model I want to share this morning, and that is the manipulator. We all know these. I don't get mad. I get mad. Amen. Revenge is best served. Full. Exactly. It's to please me or pay. Either do what I want you to do or else I am going to make you hurt. And I'm going to react to what you've done. I have a lot of anger about that. I'm not going to express that right now. I'm going to hang on to that. And later on, you're going to regret you did this. And again, stunning. Religious people are very susceptible to this type of model manipulator. First one that comes to my mind is Judas. Judas spent three years with Jesus, and now Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. Well, he didn't like hearing that. Hey, I just spent three years following you. I didn't follow you to Jerusalem for you to die. We're supposed to be kings of the world. You're supposed to run the whole planet, and I'm supposed to be one of your governors. And I'm going to have money and popularity and authority and power and everything a man wants. And you're going to what? You're going to what? Die? Well, he was decimated because his whole goal of being important and in charge and wealthy had just been shot down by Jesus' prediction. And so he was angry. How did he get back in Jesus for that? Kiss on the cheek. Put 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. Wow. That's a manipulator. <coughs> a classic example of manipulators were the Pharisees. It's the Sabbath. Jesus is there, and they're watching Jesus, these Pharisees, these hypocrites, these legalists. They're watching Jesus to see if he's going to heal on the Sabbath so they can bust him for it. And knowing their hearts, in Luke 6, it says, He told the man with the withered hand, Stand up. And come forth. And the man with the withered hand came forth. And he asked all those guys a question. On the Sabbath, is it lawful to do good or harm? To give life or to destroy? Well, guess what? No one answered that question. No one in that room answered that theological question. Any other question, they would have been arguing about it for two hours. So is it lawful to help somebody on the Sabbath or not? And they didn't answer. And so he told the man, stretch out your hand. And the man did stretch out his hand. And the Pharisees' reaction to it is, and I quote, they were furious and began to plot with each other what they might do to Jesus. How dare him heal that guy in front of us and ask him the question, make us look stupid. Who is this upstart from Nazareth? He didn't even go to our schools. He's not part of our club. He doesn't even wear our clothes. He doesn't look like he's part of us. So therefore, we don't trust him. We don't like this. We don't like what he's saying. We don't like what he's doing. And they began very early in his ministry to start talking about how are we going to get rid of this guy. And they did it didn't for a couple of days anyway. So, whether it's a monster or a mute or a martyr or a manipulator, It's been kind of fun preaching this already because some of you guys have been giggling and kind of snickering and I see some of this going on. You know, it's like the wife looked at the husband going. 
and the husband's been looking at the wife going, but now you're kind of quiet. Okay, she's a little bit more downcast. Because anger is a problem. Isn't it? I know that when we come here on the property, we put our first and best selves out. I know that we reject. And, and, and it's, it's good that we do have joy and self-control and honor God with our lives and our behavior. That ought to be consistent, should it not, family? What you are on Highway 99 around Ripon ought to match what you're like at 99 around Men. <laughs> Or Merced, or Chowchilla, or in the parking lot. What we're like in this building should match what we're like in the grocery store or Costco. <laughs> or Costco gas line. There you go. <laughs> hey, you want to test your patience? Go to Costco at 5 o'clock on Friday and try and fill up. The problem is we live in a society that doesn't care to control their own. They're very selfish, self-centered. They want things their way as soon as they want them. And they just run right over us, around us, right on top. We do that. And there's, I'm, there's plenty of reasons to be angry, amen? I mean, we're not being weak or immature or unspiritual. We're just in a world that is selfish and destructive and unjust and unfair. And so we have reasons to be angry. What do we do with that anger? That's really what this is about. Well, I've got, I've got some good news for you. The good news is that you learn these models that I shared with you today. You learn them from your parents. You learned them growing up. You learned them from movies or books or, or television. You moved it, maybe you learned them from friends. Or maybe it's been your environment. Maybe, but you've learned it somewhere. you learned how to mismanage anger somehow. Or handle it correctly somehow. But these mismanagement models can be unlearned. And that's the good news. You learn how not to handle anger correctly. You can also be taught to learn how to handle it anger in a godly fashion. Be angry and sin not. We'll look at that verse in Ephesians next week. Well, guess who's right here to help us? His name is the Comforter. His name is the Counselor. He's also known as the Holy Spirit. Those of you who have been baptized into Christ receive the gift of the forgiveness of your sins and then a secondary gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He resides in you. He is the inner coach. He's got the whistle around his neck and he's asking you to perform at your best. And when you don't, he's there to help you. Yeah, make you feel bad when you don't do the right thing and encourage you when you've fallen short and want to do the right thing. He's there. The Holy Spirit's there. And next week we'll talk more about how you actually handle things in a biblical way. And so, uh, if there's something on your heart where you're just struggling and troubled, uh, maybe you feel like you have no power over your, your fits of rage, that might be because you're not even saved. You don't even have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will not live in a sinful person. Isn't that right, church? There's no such thing as a disobedient disciple. You either are or you're not. You either are, are holy or not holy. And, and we're made holy by the blood of Christ. We're also given the Spirit to keep us that way. It's called sanctification. But maybe you're not even there. Maybe you've never even really been saved. Maybe you never really have been forgiven. Maybe you never really have had your sins washed away. And the Spirit of God has never really taken up precedence. And He will give you the power to overcome your flesh. He will. That's His job inside of us. He did a great job. Amen. Maybe you have already given your life to Christ. But you compromise that over the years or some by some event, and, and you feel weakened by that, and you don't feel like the Spirit of God is moving in your life, or or you want to learn more about how 
overcome some of these traits, uh, then let us know. We're going to stand up and we have a song. If you want to have prayer or discussion about any of these things, let us know if you stand up.